Hey everyone, my name is Chow. Welcome to a little analysis of some things from the first two episodes of Life is Strange, as well as some reasoning for one of the bigger decisions I made during my playthrough. It goes without saying that this video is going to contain major spoilers, seriously. So if you haven't seen my playthrough or anyone else's playthrough for that matter and don't want anything spoiled for you, close this video now. Still here? Okay, let's talk. There have been a bunch of mysteries that have been brought up in Life is Strange thus far. This video is going to focus on the red notebooks, slash red binders, whatever you want to call them, that were first introduced during the ending of episode 1. Originally, I thought these things were VHS tapes. At the end of episode 2, however, we see that they're actually folders, full of pages of what I assume are pictures of the girls that each binder is labeled after. Here's Kate's. The big question is, who do these red binders belong to? Who is it that is taking these photos and scrapbooking them? When I went back through the episodes to get all the collectible pictures I missed, I noticed something that shed a lot of light on these questions. One of the collectible photos I missed was here in Miss Grant's science classroom. I walked inside and immediately I saw it. A red binder sitting on her desk. Take a good look at it. It's of the same color and it has the same little hole as the ones with the girls' names labeled on them. This must mean that whoever those red scrapbook binders belong to is likely to be either faculty or staff at Blackwell Academy. If we examine the members of the faculty and staff at Blackwell, we can see that only two individuals really stand out as potential owners for the red scrapbook binders. One is David Madsen, and the other is Mark Jefferson. You can see that Jefferson has a whole bunch of these binders in the back of his classroom. Although these binders in particular are of a black variety, I'm certain he would have red ones too, since he is a faculty member. You can also see that David Madsen has one in his garage, right next to the TV hooked up to all the surveillance cameras in Chloe's house. Now we know that David Madsen has got an obsession for security and surveillance, and he's been hassling Kate Marsh. Hell, Max even caught him taking photos of Kate in the rain while she was skipping class in episode 2. We know that Mark Jefferson is the school's photography teacher, and that he's talented and famous in the field of photography. From the evidence presented in the game thus far, I'm betting that the red scrapbook binders belong to Jefferson. If you take a close look at the end sequence in episode 2, you'll notice that the photo of Kate on the page from Kate's binder is in black and white. Who has a thing for black and white photography? Mark Jefferson. He teaches the subject with what seems like passion and expertise. So today we're studying chiaroscuro. That beautiful word about the contrast between light and dark. The shadow play that gives photography such visual power. It's basic yin and yang. Black and white images are effective precisely because of their contrasts. His black and white photography work has been published in magazines. Check out this magazine cover. It says Jefferson's noir art style. Plus, all the photos right outside of Blackwell's entrance are in black and white. They're all Jefferson's photos, you can see his name on the back of each and every one of them. David Madsen may have taken pictures of Kate, sure, but they're more of a photo surveillance nature. Plus, they're in color. These are reasons why I think the red scrapbooks belong to Mark Jefferson. Now I want to talk about my decision to blame Mark Jefferson for why Kate was on the roof. If you chose to blame David, the conversation gets us suspended and it really doesn't seem like it's him at all. At least to me it doesn't. Oh, grow Excuse up. Excuse me, I was there. I saw you getting in her face. You have no idea what you saw. Kate Marsh was involved with a bad crowd. I was trying to find out who. Kate had a double life. I was super shocked when I found out. No, you were part of the crowd. And like I said, I personally saw David physically harass Kate Marsh. You lying little... Shh. Are you going to take this junkie's word over your security officer? I know she smokes and deals what? marijuana. That has nothing to do with Kate. Max, falsely accusing other people seems to be a habit with you. I trust my security officer. I'll have to investigate to see if this accusation is true. Therefore, Max, I'm obliged to contact your parents and suspend you for a few days. If we blame Nathan, then we're presented with his story, which is rather conflicting with what Kate told us happened. All I know is that Kate was at a party and Nathan dosed her. She got wasted and kissed some boys on a viral video without a clue. I dosed her? <laughs> without a clue. Have you seen the video? Whatever. Kate was loaded and You're a liar. The field. You told Kate you took her to the emergency room. I said I was going to take her to the ER. She sobered up eventually. 
Bullshit. Something happened to her and you know it. Right here. Nathan claims that Kate sobered up eventually, so he didn't take her to the ER. This is a totally different story than what Kate had told us. I remember... I remember getting sick and dizzy. Go on. Then Nathan Prescott said he would take me to the hospital. Nathan Prescott? Oh shit. He was being nice for a change when he offered to help me. He's the opposite of nice. What next? All I recall is driving for a long time. Then I woke up in a room. I thought it was a hospital because it was so white and bright. Go on. I'm listening. Somebody was talking to me in a soft voice. I thought it was a doctor until I heard Nathan and felt a sharp sting in my neck. Now I know what you're thinking. Nathan's a liar and totally full of shit. Why didn't you blame it on him? Well, first off, we as the player never actually get to see Kate's video. Second, Kate said that all she recalled, recalled, was driving for a long time before reaching that room with the bright white walls. We know that she was under the influence of some kind of drug, so her recollection might not be all that good. Furthermore, I as the player personally don't know this girl too well. I'm not sure I could trust anybody in this game to tell me the absolute truth. Yes, she's a religious girl. She could be telling me the complete unadulterated truth. But there is a possibility that she's trying to preserve her image to at least the only person that is willing to hear her out. Us, the player, Max. It's just not concrete enough for me personally to jump into blaming Nathan all the way. He might be an asshole. He is an asshole. But with the evidence at hand, his word is just as good as Kate's in my opinion. There's not enough concrete evidence for me to believe that one person is lying and the other isn't. Now let's get to Jefferson. The original question that Principal Wells asked is why was Kate on that roof? When Max puts the blame on Jefferson, Jefferson counters by saying that Kate was upset that Max didn't pick up her calls that day. I saw Mr. Jefferson talking to Kate right before our class. Then she ran off crying. Mark, I do know that Miss Marsh has assisted you on class events. Kate, Miss Marsh has been very withdrawn lately. I assume this awful video was the cause. I hated seeing the students laugh at her. She was upset Miss Caulfield didn't return her calls. I have no idea where he got that from because I picked up Kate's call in the diner. Hey, Kate. What's up? Please don't let your best friend get in the way. You okay? Bullshit alert one. This is why I chose him. It was the most rational decision, I think, because I knew he was lying about something. With Nathan, it was all speculation. And, as a side note, he said Max didn't pick up the calls. He didn't mention text. During my playthrough, I missed Kate's texts while in the junkyard, but I don't think missing them warranted any blame since they weren't that important. You can take a look for yourself. Here they are. Anyway, Principal Wells goes on to inform us that Kate had been an assistant to Jefferson for some time now. He didn't specify the nature of their relationship, but knowing that there was something between the two of them outside of just a teacher-student relationship in the classroom certainly does explain why she'd approach him for help in the hallway. Speaking of which, here's something else that bothers me about this guy. What if Kate brought this on herself? She means well, but maybe she doth protest too much. She seems like she's holding back the truth. Right there. Perhaps she doth protest too much. This is a quote from Shakespeare's Hamlet, which is also quoted on the side of a boat in the junkyard. How this line applies to this situation, and basically how it's used in Hamlet, goes like this. Kate is vehemently defending herself about the video, but she's doing it so much that people are starting to believe the opposite to be true. They're starting to believe that perhaps what happened in the video was indeed the real Kate Marsh, the one that she doesn't share with others. And they're starting to believe that because she is so strongly defending herself. So basically what I infer from this is that Mark Jefferson is trying to take as unbiased of a stance as possible with regard to Kate's video. I don't think he's victim blaming here, but he's definitely not 
sympathetic towards her. All he's saying is that he acknowledges that she might be bringing all the criticism of the other students upon herself by adamantly protesting as much as she has. This is a fair opinion, sure. I think it's a fair opinion. But I don't think any respectable teacher would share this opinion with another student. Like, why would you share that with Max? There's something just not right with him. He, he was a little too open about that opinion. If he wanted to be a completely unbiased teacher, he wouldn't have opened his mouth about this at all. Furthermore, why wouldn't you be sympathetic, at least a little bit, to a student who was your assistant, you know? If Kate had helped him out on projects before, you would think the man would be a little bit more sympathetic to what has happened to her. Also, as a side note, I think the person that called Jefferson on the phone might have been Kate trying to talk to him more about stuff after she walked out of the school. I have absolutely no evidence to back it up though, so this is just my gut instincts talking. I don't know, maybe. Here's my theory of what's been going on in this game so far. The red scrapbooks belong to Mark Jefferson. There's something extremely weird going on between Principal Wells, Nathan Prescott, and Mark Jefferson. And finally, I think David Madsen is doing an investigation of the disappearance of Rachel Amber. The reason he's been hassling Kate is because he believes that she either knows something or is somehow involved in Rachel's disappearance. Right there, Kate is another matter entirely. Why is he doing an investigation, you might ask? Well, it's pretty simple. Deep, deep inside, David really does love and care about his stepdaughter Chloe. And Rachel's Chloe's best friend. This is how he shows his love and affection for her. Because we know the guy is kind of weird and he doesn't know how to express himself very well. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. I'm basing these guesses on what I've seen in the game so far, but I'm sure that I haven't seen everything there is to see. I could totally be wrong about these things, but I guess we'll have to wait until episode 3 is released to find out. <laughs>